Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, m and Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. So how does a young lady who was raised in, originally in Westchester, then Long Island, who really liked going to the library, who worked for AMP, become a leading public relations? That's what my quest is for the next 26 minutes, to tell you about Ms. Heaviside over here, who is the president and CEO of Epic Five. Thank you for being here. It's nice to be here, Michael. So Tell me about your grandparents, because it's an interesting story about the pharmacist and some other things. Yeah. Tell me. Well, my grandmother on my mother's side was a maid. She was came. She came from, from Ireland, Ireland, right? And she worked at a wealthy home in Manhattan. And one day, uh, this young man from another wealthy family came for dinner. And as she saw him drive away in his horse and carriage, she said to herself. I'd love to marry someone that someday like that. And lo and behold, they did get married. And the father disowned them, the right? The father disowned them. The father, the story is, and I'm not sure that this is completely accurate, the father uh, put in all the cobblestone uh, curbs in Brooklyn. That was his business. He was very wealthy. And he, his son went to pharmacy school, and then uh, when the, he disowned them, uh, my grandfather and grandmother lived in the Bronx, and that's where my mother was raised. And what about on the other side? The other side, both my father's uh, family came from Ireland, whereas my mother's father was actually from a German, Amer a German family. Now, how did your parents meet? I believe they went, uh, they were both on vacation in the Catskills. In the Catskills. And the site of so many wonderful love affairs, uh, they met and they started dating. Now your dad, uh, oh, when you were growing up, was in the meat business, right? Yes, my father had a wholesale meat business. Okay, you were born in, in uh, Manhattan or Brooklyn? I was born in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, right? Yes, and then uh, raised for the first six years in Westchester where my father's family was. And then one day, uh, my mother and father, with their two little children, with took a hundred, a drive, with a hundred dollars, right? Took a drive out to Long Island, put a hundred dollars down on a house that they bought for nine thousand nine hundred ninety dollars. But it was different. It was a house, you know. It was with a backyard. It was. It was when Long Island didn't have roads. I mean, yeah. the expressway wasn't. How far did the expressway? Everything end? was thirty miles an hour. It was Sunrise Highway and Twenty Five A, and. My, uh, when I was growing up there, my, uh, I used to play at a dairy farm where they, I was taught how to Cow. make cows. Oh, cows, I remember. And 
climbed trees and just it was wonderful but it was short-lived because Long Island started to fill in with homes very very quickly. Now you tell me an interesting story uh, your father was in the wholesale meat business uh, and uh, one day um, you go down and you see the truck. Oh okay, yeah so well I was the oldest of four children I had three younger brothers and and I knew I was my father's favorite and one day he took me down to see his trucks being painted and I went there and I said you know it says Thomas F. O'Grady wholesale meats but it's not centered and he said well that's because someday it'll say and sons and sort of in one shocking moment but I even realized, though you were the apple of the eye you I were realized you, that it I'd wasn't going to be sons and daughters okay no. it, yeah, it was yeah. I realized that I would be on the sideline of something my father really loved now so. you see I did the life of uh, Mr. Russ of Russ and Daughters and he said Grandpa Russ made sure that it was and daughters yeah but they had no sons so well. the son-in-laws were in the business but a <laughs> different case so so what um, now, where was your father's business at this time? Was it? Uh, he. It was in um, the wholesale market. I think it was in, in the Bronx? Brooklyn, and I think it was in Manhattan. He he sold mostly to high end restaurants and uh, and to hotels. As a matter of fact, I never had a hamburger till I was thirteen, because we always had steaks and. Um, Shops, so, so you're telling me about going to Catholic school, okay? You know the nuns and yeah. the small rooms, and you weren't allowed to raise your hand. And well, you know, it so was not. I mean, it was not something. I, I was, mean, I'm not saying it were, was. It was the, the, they were terrible. raking the. No. Okay, but there it was, was very 60, stringent. It was uh, 60 students in the room, and she taught preparatory. There was no kindergarten. Preparatory first and second in one room, and she would teach each group and then move on to the next. And you weren't allowed to raise your hands unless she asked for hands. And because there was no bathroom in this school, the bathroom was in the new school for the older grades down the hill, uh, there was one bathroom break a day and you had to walk down the hill to go to the girls and boys room. And as a matter of fact, she didn't want to put coats on everyone. So she told us that if we prayed, we wouldn't be cold. And it's if like you Tony were Roberts cold. with the, it was like <laughs> Tony Roberts with the, oh no, no, it's not, the, you know, the coals aren't going to hurt your feet, but don't worry. Yeah, and if you, and if you complained you were cold, she would just say, you're not praying hard enough. So, how many years were you in? Uh, only up until, I guess, just uh, shy of my third year. Now, yeah. did you work when you were going to public school? Or uh, in junior high school? Because there is a, the, the, the life-saving event that we'll talk about later on with your father's business, but. Uh, well, I worked. Uh, my mother then had two more children. I worked uh, in high school, uh, actually not in Wanto. We moved when I was 16. Which no, actually, no, I was 15. My father went bankrupt. And I was just uh, in, I guess I was at the end of my junior year. Now, you said to me, you were a voracious reader. Yes. You, you, you liked, you were in, uh, you nearly read all the books in the library, I said? Yes, and as a matter of fact, Every year at the end of school year, I would win the library award, which was very embarrassing because what it meant was that you had no social life. You just sat home and read books all weekend, which was pretty much true. So you, your father's business goes bankrupt and you're ready to go to college, but you really figured out that you really had to help the family. So one of the jobs while you're in high school is uh, at that time, you know, we didn't have six-plex movie theaters, 12-plex movie theaters. You get a job in a movie theater, right? The, I got a job the, behind the, the, the candy counter, right? Right. And um, there was no cash register. There was a cash drawer. And all of the candy was different prices, you know, 7 cents, 12 cents, 32 cents. And everyone came to the counter at the dull portions of the movie. So you'd have five deep people all picking out and I'm trying to add and I think I got eventually got pretty good at it but the theater loved me because I made so many mistakes and I always made it in their favor right so so you know what happened was they didn't have to worry about you taking money because it was always extra money. 
<laughs> Sometimes people have to worry about that. So you, you wanted to go to college, but you felt that you had a responsibility to help yeah. out the family. And I mean, you were a good student and you would have gotten possibly a scholarship over there, but you didn't and you have to get a job. And you go to what, you go into the city and you go to a Browning school? Well, actually, I went into, it was called Brown's Business College, which really wasn't. It was over some stores. And I, and I did a little research and found out that they allowed you to graduate as fast as you could pass the test. And this was more of a secretarial? Yes. Which, yeah. from your background going for liberal, I mean, in regular high school, you didn't have the secretarial skills. Well, they did, they did teach it, but at that time I was on the college track, so... Right. so you weren't learning I wasn't the learning vocational it, yes. courses. Right. So I, I went to Brown, and I finished their course, which was a year or two years, I don't remember, but I finished it in, I think it was a two-year course, I finished it in three months. Now, I know I skipped some, probably some important information, but I was able to pass the test. So what's your first job? Is it A&P? Uh, the first job, yes, was with the A&P Tea Company and... The Great Atlantic and Pacific, Pacific Tea right. Company in the Gray Bar Building right. on uh, East 42nd Street, which just still exists today. And what do you do with the A&P? Well, I was a secretary. I, I may add a really bad secretary. Uh, I, there's this thing called filing that you really should do. Plus that when I was learning... See, thank God with computers today, there's no more <laughs> filing. It's the computer files, right? Yeah. But anyway, I was there, and uh, then I got a job at an electronics firm where I did, uh, I, I did some work with their, one of their divisions, and the person left who was running it, and they put me in charge of it. But what I really wanted to do was write. You wanted to write press releases and... Well, I actually would love to have write, written books, but no one, you know, that just seemed completely out of the, uh, uh, out of the realm so, of possibility. So, so how do you then finally leave that and get a job with the legendary Howard Rubenstein, who at that time was at the Woolworth Building, you That's know? That's right. You yeah. know, at... Uh, and we would look down on City Hall. Yeah, um, I uh, actually answered a, an ad and convinced him that I was the right person because not only could I write, but I also could take care of secretarial things. So that seemed like a really good option for him. And but Howard taught you something. You told me that Howard yeah. taught you a number of great things which helped you later on because you never knew you were gonna own your own very successful and very prominent agency. And you do a lot of what Howard does, which is strategic advice and crisis management. What did Howard teach you? Well, one of the things he taught me was really that the most important thing in public relations is really how you can solve your clients' problems, putting them together with the right people. So it's very important to uh, get to know the right people. It's very important to help your clients get to know the right people. And that's probably closed more businesses for our client than... So you're working for Howard, and yep. what happens next in your life? Uh, next in my life, I think I went to an in-house, to a, uh, another company where I handled their public relations in-house and really discovered that there wasn't enough action for me. Agency work was far more active. And, and now you're having some children, correct? And then I, then I had my first child. I was offered to go and consult for one or two days a week. But the way I do things, I find it really hard to do anything unless I'm doing it 150%. So, couldn't so, do two jobs 150%. And, and the 150% job was really to, to take care of the children. Yeah. And, so, but you had some work with Red Book and some I other... Wrote, I wrote um, a, a number of articles for Red Book, for Women's Day, for fitness magazines. And, and really, then what, how, how was the yogurt and the granola business? Oh, <laughs> well, I don't think my children have quite forgiven me for this. Uh, you know, because I really enjoyed being a mother. I mean, we, I made our own yogurt and I made granola and I did all of those things that back then were really, really important. And uh, my yogurt 
it's probably as bad as my filing, but it... It's interesting. One of our heads of the, the studio over here, Adam, loves the legendary and the late Harry Chapin. And Harry Chapin was a... I mean, he was originally a Brooklyn boy, so I, you know, I, we have mm -hmm. my affinity to him. But Harry was also a great lover of Long Island. Yeah. And what, what, what happens with Harry Chapin and you? Well, Harry, uh, Harry lived near us. Our, our children, actually, I carpooled with him for uh, nursery school for a year. Anyway, he, um, I saw in the newspaper that Harry Chapin recommended that. Uh, they form a Long Island Philharmonic Orchestra. Long Island had no orchestra. So I wrote a letter saying that when the, when the orchestra is formed, I would like an opportunity to handle the public relations. Now, I had a lot of experience in New York, but nothing really out on Long Island. Tell I, me about that, because the interview was where? Grumman? I was interviewed at Grumman. Which was and a major company. Major well. company. And I went in and you know, have you ever had the experience where you sense that there's something wrong here? I don't know what it is, but I know I'm not supposed to get this job. There was something about the interview. So that was very freeing and I was very comfortable because You felt there wasn't I, I had nothing to lose. I got a call the next day and I they said, Look, we owe the advertising agency that handled the prior orchestra a great deal of money. We promised them this account. Would you be willing to take the account and split it with them? You do the work and we'll split the retainer. And since I didn't have any other work. It was a was client. A, of, yeah, it was not. But, but you told me that what really came out of that was really the creation of your business out of that yes. because part of it is that you asked them well, to, to, yes. to, if I'm splitting it, I want to go to all these yes. meetings, correct? I had said that I agree to split it, if, but I do think public relations is so important for the, for the birth of this orchestra that I will split it providing you let me come to the board meetings and give my report for public relations every month. Now, what was interesting, you also told me, was that, and this is a number of years ago, any member of this board had to make a $5,000 commitment mm -hmm. to fund the, 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 orchestra. the orchestra. And how many people were on the board? I think there were around 30, 35 people on the board. They were all, and in those days, $5,000 almost 35 years ago was a great deal of money. And only the biggest banks, the accounting firms, the larger companies could belong. And every prominent business person from the largest companies was on that board. One of the people who was one of the first people who took you on was a, a, a small little bank, Babylon. Yeah, Bank, bank of Babylon. And, and what do you do for the Bank of Babylon? I mean, you know, Howard taught you some good skills, but, you know, it was, was something new. Well, we first, we took, um, first of all, I learned banking. I really worked hard at understanding banking. And we then moved on to other clients, other banks, North Star Bank, which we had for many years, uh, Chemical Bank, which we dealt with, uh, many banks that are no longer in existence, but in that process, I really understood uh, what is, you know, what is needed in banking. Now, what's very interesting is that, that you have been uh, listed numerous as one of the top 50 most important people in Long Island by the Long Island Business, and you're involved with the LIAA. But, but also, one of the, the areas that you've done a lot of things is with regard to, uh, as I would, as Howard would probably say, Crisis management, yep. uh, crisis intervention. Mm -hmm. Explain to me what do you mean by that? Well, I mean like uh, sure, a nuclear plant, <laughs> okay. wh which is a good example of crisis. Well, crisis. It's interesting. Crises these days uh, are not just fires and I mean with, such as Oakwood Dairy or tritium leaks, which we had at Brookhaven National Lab, uh, but other things, sexual harassment. Uh, a corporate malfeasance, and they've gotten worse over the years because, first of all, there's a more critical public, 
There are more lawyers, and so therefore there are more lawsuits. And there's a 24-hour media cycle. So that companies Isn't, isn't the media are, cycle even faster today because of the internet? Oh, the yeah. The changing yeah. of the world of the media Well, cycle. I meant 24 hours a day. Right, right, there is no right. There is no stop to the media cycle. So, uh, you know, really clients, every client faces some crisis or some potential crisis. So how do and you And when we think, the, when we, we consider a victory is when it doesn't make the press. The ones, the things I'm proudest of, I can never talk about in public. Right, because you, you, you know, you're, as one would say, it's being squelched or whatever terminology we want, squashed before the, 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 the negative things come out. And it's, yeah. it's easier to do that than after, you know, it's like a, uh, I've done litigators and, you know, when the case has already hit the newspaper, then, then you have a different crisis management of how to repair it. Yeah, okay. and it, it's not, only, it's not exact, always squelching. I mean, I, I will give you an example. Uh, some years ago, we have King Collins Supermarkets as a client. Some years ago, I got a call from a police reporter and she said, I just uh, saw something that was filed that there have been a number of pickpocket incidents at the King Collins supermarket in Hicksville. Well, I said, well, let me check into it. I'll call you back. So I called and found out that what they were, what was happening is a woman would put, a, you know, put her purse in the front part of the shopping cart She'd go walk away, go to get a can of beans, and when she gets back, it's been, the wallet's been taken. So I next called an attor uh, attorney, and I said, could you give me the legal definition of pickpocketing? Is this a pickpocket? And he said, no, that's theft of untended personal belongings. Then I called and found out from the police reports that other stores in the whole shopping center all had the same issues and the same percentages. And then I found, said, who owns the shopping center? It's Del Boy. So I called the reporter back, and, I said, and I, this was right before Christmas, so I'm picturing a front page story. And I called back and I said, look, first of all, this is not a pickpocketing. So journalistically, you have to refer to it as theft of untended personal belongings, which is a very uninteresting Right. Uh, secondly... This is not sexy enough uh, for an article. Secondly, uh, you also should point out that every single store in that shopping center has the same percentage. And thirdly, you cannot refer to it as the King Cullen Shopping Center. Right, because it's not the King Cullen. It's a shopping center owned by someone else. Yeah, so it really, uh, what had happened is it did appear in the paper, but it appeared as two tiny paragraphs on page A37 next to the fold. A couple of points. Uh, interesting, you know, as, as you've said to me, you, you've been involved with a number of banks, but in 2003, John Cannis, the legendary North Fork guy who built a bank out of nothing, literally from a Mattituck bank, yeah. calls you up. Tell me about that one day. Because uh, you didn't do PR for John at no, the No, no. He called me up and he said, uh, could you come down to my office for lunch? Now, I knew him because we had represented other banks. We kind of operate in the same circles as far as business circles. A and I liked him. And I went down there, and we're having really small talk over lunch. And I'm trying, I, I'm hoping he's going to ask me to do public relations for North Fork. Uh, but I, uh, so he said, uh, I guess you're wondering why I'm, you know, you're here. So I said, yes, as a matter of fact. He said, well, uh, we have a board opening, and I'd like to ask you if you would be on our board. Now, this is the time when everyone was nervous about being on board. Sarbanes-Oxley was, you know, feared. So I said, well, I'd really like to think about it. And I went back, and I actually called friends of mine who were managing partners of some of the larger accounting firms to get their take on what this is. So I, I was told that banking is so highly regulated that you're 
And, and yep. then subsequently, <coughs> you were on the board until yep. the sale. Yes, right. right. Now, how has public relations changed from when you started the agency 35 years ago to today? Well, when I started the agency, which was started really in my home with uh, my daughter, who Laurel, who is here today, said she always, you know, she, when she was five and six, she could do a three-part fold to a press release and stuff it in envelopes, which we would do before we went to the beach. So um, it's now amazing transformation. It is an exciting time because we're not talking about the traditional media. Uh, there's some of that still around, but there's so much more on the internet, social media. You mean social like media. crowdsourcing that you and I discussed a couple <laughs> of months ago, which nobody has an idea who it is, but no, the, the yeah, world has yeah. changed. And, the and it depends on your client. Each of these tools, these are whole new box of tools uh, for public relations. Each of them are different for depending what you're doing. Now let's is. talk about the children and the grandchildren. Okay, I have three children. John is in Seattle, the oldest. Uh, the second is Paul, and he is married, and he and his wife Katie have two boys. And Jack what are and their George, names? Jack and George. And then my daughter Laurel, who's the youngest, she has two amazing lacrosse players and very smart boys. And, and Alex, guess of and my... Alex and Peter Moynihan. Okay, yes. so, they're, so they're here. So, you know, if, if you have to look back, did you ever think you'd be in this business? No, I don't think I knew what this business do you, was. Do you, do you think you would have been part of uh, O'Grady Meats? Do you think? Ah. Do you think if if the if your father's business had flourished, do you think you might have ever gone into the family business? Probably not. No, pro I mean, I really loved anything that had to do with reading and writing, and that was really my first love. I just never knew that you could actually make money doing it. Right, and, and you have done a, a great job. Um, as I said, you are the preeminent PR firm in Long Island, and uh, you also have some business in New York City, and Long yeah. Island is we a do tri state tri state area, yeah. and, and you've, you've done a, a great job, and I'd like to thank you for being here today. It's been wonderful to be here, Michael. My pleasure.